<laughs> hi, 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 and hey, hey, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Normally, we do this show every two weeks, and we had scheduled something for tonight, a bonus episode in which we were going to welcome to our channel Gary Burr. Uh, Gary, as you know, has done a lot of work with Ringo Starr, going all the way back to I Want to Be Santa Claus in 1999 oh. and on uh, the albums that followed with Mark Hudson and even post Mark Hudson. And he's had an incredible career uh, prior to working with Ringo. He's done so much songwriting, very successful as a songwriter, especially in the country field. And we're still hoping that he's going to join us. We don't know why there's been some delay in him contacting us for the show. And we're hoping that he'll be here. But in the meantime, I still got my own friends here, my own colleagues on the show. And so uh, why don't I introduce them? We got Kid O'Toole, who, of course, is the queen of Beatles social media, the author of songs who were singing, guided tours through the Beatles' lesser known tracks, and Michael Jackson FAQ, all that's left to know about the King of Pop. Also collaborated with our colleague Ken Womack with Fandom on the Beatles. Does a ton of work, all kinds of work on the internet, including uh, co-hosting another Beatles podcast, Toppermost of the Poppermost. Kit, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Good to see you and, and good to see you, Tom. And uh, two weeks in a row. <laughs> yes. I know. I can get used to this. Exactly. Always good to see you guys. Why don't we do this like every other hour? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I mean, Tom is tireless. Oh, please. Yeah. He could live and breathe uh, on YouTube as as Joe Mayo could. So, you know, that's nothing for, for either of the, the youngsters. In the yeah. They are. There you go. And we got Tom Hunyadi here, of course, one half of Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast. Always putting out lots of great shows with Annie Nichols. Tom, how you doing? Ken, I'm I'm great. And, uh, you know, we just, uh, matter of fact, speaking of Annie, we just recorded a show earlier before we came on here, you know, talking about the uh, uh, the new uh, 50th anniversary of uh, right. Band on the Run. So that was a lot of fun. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that today, too. Yeah, well, I just think that uh, hopefully Gary will join yeah. us. He can pop in at any given time. We hope he does. But in the meantime, I uh, just got a couple of news items here. Um, and of course, uh, it's. <laughs> I really wish Gary was here because yeah. the biggest news item of the past week is all about Ringo's um, activities in the recording studio. Um, he just posted a video update. And he said that he had planned to make a country EP, but it looks like it may turn out to be a CD with 10 tracks. This is what he's working on at the moment. And coming very soon uh, will be the next EP, which is actually called Crooked Boy, produced by Linda Perry. Linda also wrote all the songs. And Ringo's video shows the song titles and the mm -hmm. lyrics as well. The titles for the EP are Gonna Need Someone, Crooked Boy, February Sky, and Adeline, or Adeline. Uh, Ringo also displayed his latest book, Beats and Threads, which illustrates all the drum kits Ringo has used through the years, and the clothes he wore. He specified the 60s and 70s. The book is available right now. It's available through juliansauctions.com. And Ringo also mentioned that in May and June, he and the All-Stars will be on tour. We already mentioned he has six dates in Las Vegas, but he just added another six dates for the tour. One in Saratoga, California, one in San Bernardino, California, and two in Mexico City, as well as one in Hidalgo, Texas, and one in Austin, Texas. And he said he plans to do another tour after that in September and October, Always check the tour tab on Ringo's website to see if he's adding more shows at RingoStar.com. Uh, I mean, he'll be 84 for that second leg. I mean, amazing. I, I hope I can walk without a cane when I'm 84, let alone. <laughs> hey, compared four. to Willie Nelson, he's a baby. 
Yeah, yeah. that's true. Well, there you go. 90 years old and he's still out there. Yeah. What an inspiration. No kidding. What they love. So we're going to see for this first, uh, well, the first two months here, if he's going to add more dates. It's That's 12 dates, and that's usually less than what he does. So we shall see. Um, and also at last night's Grammy Awards, the only time that the Beatles were represented was for the, the uh, best music video. And they won for the animated video made for I'm Only Sleeping. M. Cooper, the video director, gave an acceptance speech. She said, quote, it was a labor of love. I painted more than 1,300 oil paintings. Wow. In the nation. And I... Just like to dedicate this to anyone who labors under the spirit of a kind of restless soul who will not stop in the pursuit of making art. Mm. And, mm. The quote. and she also thanked John Paul George and Ringo. And Peter Asher also won a special merit award as well. I had several pages worth of news, but I wanted to cut it short <laughs> to make way for Gary Bird tonight. So, uh, Let's hope that Gary will join us. But in the meantime, I know, Tom, you, you just held up um, the Band on the Run 50th anniversary issue. And uh, I've been listening to the underdubbed mixes. Yep. yep. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? And we'll get yours too, Kit. Well, first, I want to say that the, the Half Speed Master is one of the best listening experiences I've ever had with uh, Band on the Run. Uh -huh. uh, it's simply amazing. It's it's just as good as the last uh, with four records that have that have had the half speed mastering. You know, in the, in the early '80s, Columbia when when Paul was with Columbia, they did a half speed master of Band on the Run um, then as well. As that sounds great, but this with with you know the, the current technology, uh, it's just the mind blowing experience. Listening experience, very very happy listening to an album that we're <laughs> well, some of us might be kind of burnt out on, but um, again, it was just. You know, once you get like 20 copies of Band on the Run, they all sometimes sound the same, but but not in this case. This was an absolutely, again, a phenomenal listening experience. Now, getting to the, uh, oh, and then also Kit O'Toole showed the CD. Now, it's also important to notice, note that the, 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 the CD version is from the 2010 archive uh, release. Uh, it's not the current has to be master that is only on on the vinyl mm -hmm. so um that should be noted as well yeah and i like how they got the little and you open it up yeah uh, in the middle it's got the the booklets in a, like its own little parachute i mean uh, i mean a kangaroo pouch there um the which is, my, yeah yeah on, which i'll turn is, my background off <laughs> you can really see it yeah but uh but it, it's and then also the cds are in their own little uh their own little cases as well inside the slip so it's just not the uh the there cds in the in the slips you know so i think i put a little bit more effort was put into the uh to the the digi pack here even though i'm not the biggest fan of these digi packs but um you know but yeah so there's nice the poster, the poster right there oh yeah, yeah. we open it out yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a nice uh nice package here there we go Fortunately, they didn't take photos of while they were being mugged, uh, so they couldn't, <laughs> couldn't uh, see who took the the, the supposed tapes. But um, uh, but uh, but fine, fine Polaroid shots nonetheless. But um, but getting back to the underdubbed, I got to tell you, I mean, it, it is it uh, for my list for my ears. I mean, it's a fine listening experience. I mean, some of it is you know, really much to do about nothing, but uh, there's some great stuff in there. Uh, you know, 1985, I know some people don't like the fact that it's an instrumental, but for me, it makes me appreciate the instrumentation that they did. And then I also think it's one of Paul's greatest vocals uh, throughout his career. So it kind of makes me miss that vocal a little bit more, but you know, his piano playing uh, in there, you know, Linda's uh, backing vocals, Linda and Denny's backing vocals really stand out. And um, I, I think that's great. Jet, um, you know, not hearing those horns uh, at the beginning uh, mm -hmm. is definitely a surprise at first, but uh, again, I mean, the stuff that's missing, um, just makes you appreciate the final product because for me, Bluebird is not my favorite, but I really look forward to hearing that Howard Casey, I'm sorry, Howie Casey, um, you know, sax solo in there. I think that really highlights the the song. Um, what else do I got here? You know, and then I'm a big fan of No Words. I think No Words is one of his best pop 
tunes, you know, quick, you know, two and a half minute pop songs that he has, uh, you know, co-written with Denny. But uh, I love that there's no orchestration in there as well. I, I think it's just a great little tune with it or without it. Um, but the, but like, you know, we were talking at, at the, you know, before we hit the record button, the, the last third of Band on the Run, right? I mean, that's the biggest difference there, you know, without the orchestration. Uh, I think it's also a different vocal as well. It is definitely. And, yeah, it's different once vocal. You get, that, once you get into when, well, the rain exploded with a mighty crash from right, that, right. On, it's a different right. vocal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, uh, the, the no, uh, you know, guitar bits, you know, electric guitar bits during that le during, the, during that last third of the song too. Um, I kind of miss that. I look forward to those little sly guitar bits um, there during the during that segment. But but all in all, I think it's 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 a fine listening experience. I mean, you, you kind of wish, you know, like where was this in 2010 when the you know when these first started the uh, you know the the archive series, hmm. but. Um, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, if, if he's going to try to sell this again to us for the 50th time, you know, he's got, you know, give us a little, give us a little candy to go with it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, had a chance to listen uh, to all of them yet, but that's been kind of the impression that I've gotten from uh, from a lot of people that it's it's a, a been it's getting pretty mixed reviews so far uh right. that that some of the uh some of the the underdubbed mixes are interesting in, in in many ways what you were saying tom um you know that some of the instrumentals right are interesting no but in other ways there are very little you know very few differences and mm. so it's kind of like a well you know I, I think you just made a very good point why didn't they include some of this in that box set, I mean that that right. would have been interesting. These would have been interesting additions there, but you know, separately and, and you know now, you know. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked about this too because we we've got sprinkles of it um, throughout the archive release. Like I remember when Wildlife came out, and then some people never know when you listen to that. You 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 hear at least in that rough mix. You hear Denny Sywell playing a trumpet. Uh, you know mm -hmm. that you don't hear in the finish you know, products. So it's stuff like that, that, you know, in, in like Paul mimicking guitar solo or, or, or mimicking like what he wants to hear from the horn, uh, you know, when that, that comes in, I mean, that kind of stuff is, is kind of cool because you see, like, as we know, the man knows what he wants and he knows where he wants it, you know? So, you know, that kind of stuff that I love, I love hearing that kind of stuff, you know, throughout a song or, or an early mix of a song. Me too. I love that kind of thing. And, and, you know, but I also love demos. I would have loved to have heard mm -hmm. some demos here. You know, I love hearing a song in progress. We've talked about right. that many times on our show. Uh, you know, I, I love hearing that, you know, a work in progress and, and you get a little of that here, but you know, not enough. Right. Not enough. Yeah, exactly. And well, I'm, I, I definitely that. have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, there's, there's parts of it where, well, we first heard uh, Ben on the Run, the title track, when when that leaked out. And I thought, wow, if the rest of the album's like this, I'm really going to be thrilled. Because I love the fact that most of the, the lead vocals from Paul were a different vocal take. So I thought the rest of this would be just like that. But it's only like that in a few instances. Um, what I find most interesting about this is that um, it's pretty obvious that whatever they've left out in these mixes the percussion is the mm. same it's the same as what was on the album right so they laid everything over that there's right. nothing different about any of the drum tracks or anything like that if anything it was guitars that were taken out or horns or howie casey saxophone orchestration mm -hmm. that kind of stuff um and the thing is, there are certain songs like Bluebird. The only difference I heard in Bluebird is not hearing Howie Casey's sax solo. Right. Um, same thing with Mrs. Vanderbilt. You don't hear the saxophone in there. Right, right. Um, there are little things that you notice, like in Mrs. Vanderbilt in the release version, Paul does an ad lib and he goes, no use. And that's yeah. not it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of miss that. And something like Mamunia, which is almost exactly the same, you don't have the um, 
the answering and the harmonies um, when Paul is singing uh, the next time you say L.A. rain, right. cut, whatever, and then you'd hear you see rain, you right. know, that answering back, that's not there. So right. that tells you that was laid on afterwards. OK, so that I, just knowing that I found that interesting. Right. But to me, when you've got something like Band on the Run or Jet Without the Horns and it's just the band. Right. You know, it's that's how they would sound before any of the overdubbing so it's really cool to hear it that way let me roll it is a real treat for me because mm -hmm. um the second verse is the same as what's on the album but everything else is a completely different mccartney vocal mm -hmm. and there's a lot of echo on it but his vocals yeah. are fantastic on let me yeah yeah so you know, there's as you listen more and more, you'll probably hear things that aren't there. Like um, no words, not only doesn't have the um, orchestration at the beginning, but they doubled a bit on the guitars, and you don't hear that part. Right, right. Yeah. So it's more bare. Yeah, I mean, you don't get the uh, you don't get the the synth uh, solo in Jet either, uh, which is um, you know another bit that I look forward to when I hear Jet. Uh, that's mm. not there either. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with Picasso's last words, right. you don't hear the clarinet part. Right. You mm -hmm. know, there's like a TV radio kind of thing in there that you hear that that's not there. Um, there's like, you, you know, you call ad libbing. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that is. I mean, because it kind of with the way it's, it's it sounds, it's kind of sounds like it's, you know, kind of like what the one he did with. um uh honey pie you know it's kind of sounds like it might be like from a radio or a tv um at least to my ears and it sounds like it's also in another language like french or italian yeah oh. i think that's french okay but you know i'm glad that it came out it's just that um it's hard for me to imagine that there are that there aren't outtakes of any kind of these songs I'd yeah love those right um and it's still debatable about the whole demo situation because right. you do know that there were demos made when Henry McCullough was in the band and Denny Sywell. And as Paul has told the story, they were stolen when they were in Lagos. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just can't believe that the master tapes were taken. I just, he's got to have them in his collection somewhere. He just made a cassette copy that he took with him. To right. Me. Right. So, why haven't we heard that? Yeah. With all these different versions of Ben on the because Run. It's that's the story. Out. It's the story, Ken. It's the story of we're going to show them. We're going to show them. We're going to show Denny and Henry that we're going to make a kick ass record. And we're not going to let them hear. Oh, we're not going to let them hear those demos that are supposedly better, according to Denny. We don't want them to hear that because, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to show them. Mm hmm. I don't know, but that's the whole idea now be, behind archival releases is to show the development of songs. And Paul has gotten more and more into that with early versions of songs like on Flaming Pie, yeah. you know. So yeah. you would think that here it is, another anniversary. They do something maybe a little bit more creative than this. Yeah. I mean, I'm just picturing right now in front of the mixing console, Bluebird, bring the fader down on Howie Casey. <laughs> how much yeah. more can, did they do you know to put out this version you know mm -hmm. it's um you know well, i mean you appreciate all the other instrumentation as you hear it as is and i understand right. but i just well, wish that there was more that was removed or something more revealing right. about it. and i i do love uh 19, 1985 the way it is you do hear the harmony vocals in the bridge Mm -hmm. you know, that's the only vocals you hear there's no vocals from paul and it is great his his piano playing on the song so otherwise it's like karaoke you know um, yeah. unfortunately i don't have my copy of the mccartney legacy because we can see when howie casey did in fact lay down uh you know his parts because it does say here on the back of the record that this uh that the set or this you know this um, the underdub was was put together by jeff um on you know uh london um the, the october 14th of 73 mm -hmm. so you know we know it didn't come out until what two months later so when did howie you know when did he lay down his his, his parts right so 
it might yeah, not have been, have or, no, you know, just lower him in the mix because he might not even been in this mix yet. Mm -hmm. Well, we do know that all the stuff that followed, all the orchestration from Tony Visconti, all that stuff was done later. Mm -hmm. oh, Abby, Gary's right? here. Gary hey. is here. He is? Yes. He's I don't see him. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> But he's coming in. Yay. <laughs> That's good okay. to hear. Yep. Oh, oh, we had him okay. there for there he is. There he is. Hey, there, there he is. is. Gary. Hey, I'm so Gary. sorry. I missed up the Eastern time and the Central time. That's okay. No worries. No worries. Glad you're here. Hello, Gary. Very dark in here. <laughs> <laughs> but we're glad you're here. Welcome to Talk More Talk. I'm happy to be here. It's wonderful to see you guys. Look at those smiling faces. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, we are we are on the air and we're just so so excited to to have you and to talk about uh your work with Ringo and also just your songwriting and and what you're uh, what you are up to. Uh, Come on. All right, let's let's <laughs> go. So Ken, uh Ken, take it take it away. Well, normally at the beginning of the show, we have uh, a bit of news, which we already brought to our viewers. Um, and the first news item was really about everything going on with Ringo right now from his video update. But we're going to talk a little bit about that later on because Ringo thrilled all of us with this news that he's in the middle of making a country album, not an EP. And I know that you're involved with that. I am. So, yes. But uh, before we get to that, I would like, you know, our, our viewers to know more about you and your whole history in the music industry, because I know that um, from your childhood on, there was lots of different music that you enjoyed listening to, not just the Beatles, but you were also attracted to country music and folk music growing up. Um, and originally, you, you really wanted to be a recording artist, but you ended up being a songwriter for so many country artists that it's it's mind-boggling <laughs> all yeah. the people that you've written songs for um i just want to read a brief list and this is only maybe 10 percent, folks juice newton reba mcintyre faith hill letty lady antebellum kenny rogers winona olivia newton john tim mcgraw Oak Ridge boys garth brooks randy travers tommy shaw leonard skinner joey molland and that's um also writing with Carol King, who you toured with. Right. What what history right there, even before working with Ringo? I mean, for for us Beatle fans who heard your name from your work on, on Ringo's albums and performing with Ringo, to learn all this about you, it's um it's it's so impressive what you've done. Talk about the beginning of your career and what led to you're being a major songwriter, especially with country artists. Well, I went to Woodstock, the original Woodstock. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to uh, be an electrician. My dad was an electrician and had a company and I used to work for him. And uh, they kind of expected that I would grow up and take over the business. But I went to Woodstock and uh, I kind of, the realization hit me that the guys up on stage there were getting a lot more girls than electricians ever could. <laughs> so I came back from Woodstock and decided uh, the guy that I was there with was a drummer. And I decided that I was going to learn guitar and we were going to start a band. So um Right after that, I got my leg broken and I was in a body cast and I learned how to play the guitar laying on my back. I had my brother's guitar. And the crazy thing is, like the the three albums that I learned guitar from were like uh, Tapestry, a Beatle album and a Pure Prairie League album. Mm. And I grew up and I became the lead singer of Pure Prairie League. I toured the world playing with Carol and I've worked with Ringo. So that was a crazy coincidence that you can't figure out. So in this band, I became the writer because we were doing songs by the Birds and the Beatles. And, and at one point, everybody realized the guitar players in those bands wrote the songs. 
So they all turned to me and said, you're our guitar player. You're supposed to write our songs. Mm. So I wrote a bunch of really bad Neil Young Beatle ripoffs. <laughs> and uh, eventually I wrote one that I sent off to a guy in New York that I knew. And uh, he liked it and he helped me get a record deal. And I had my own record out in 1978. And... Uh, immediately the record company went out of business. So we both agreed that I would try to write songs for other people while we tried to get me a record deal. So that was when I wrote the Juice Newton song in 1982, Love's Been a Little Bit Hard on Me. And I wrote an Oak Ridge Boys hit and I started to have hits down in country. And mm -hmm. I started to go to Nashville more and more often. And uh, I put a band together down there to do showcases to try to get my own record deal. And it was a great band. All these people went on to do amazing things and not, I couldn't get a record deal. And finally I said, I'm gonna do one more show. And I did one more show at the Bluebird and a lady from Warner Brothers was there. And after the show, she was still there. So I thought, this is it, I'm getting a deal. Mm. And I walked up to her and she said, I would love to talk about a deal. And I said, great. And then she said, would you introduce me to your background singer? And that's how my background singer got the record deal. And I didn't. And that was Faith Hill. Oh, so you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> and what happens is once you start having hits, record companies don't believe that you're willing to go on the road and ride in buses all over the country when you could sit home and open your mailbox and get money. And I think that's what kept me from getting a record deal. So I settled into the writing thing and I was happy to do it. And uh, um, like I said, in the in the 80s, uh, for about five or six years, I was in, I took Vince Gill's place in Pure Prairie League. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, I met uh, Carol and worked with Carol and, and toured the world playing in a, in a trio with her. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Mark Hudson was generous enough to call me up and say, hey, I'm working with Ringo. You want to come on board and, and, and make some music? And that's what brought me into the Ringo camp. And, and about seven years ago, I started a trio with uh, my wife, Georgia Middleman, and Kenny Loggins called Blue Sky Riders. So we had that going. So it's, uh, you know, it seems to uh, have been a, a busy a busy life. That's really fascinating. You would think that it, people who work in record companies see someone that's written these hits, the Oak Ridge Boys, Juice Newton. They would think, hey, you know, he's got a band. Why don't we sign him and the band? I mean, that's proof right there that you have the talent to write these hit records. You would think they would have that kind of mindset instead. But they've been burned too many times. They've had too many examples of writers that let a record company invest a whole bunch of money in them to be artists. And then once they're on the road, they miss their home, they miss their kids. And and they go to the record company and go, I don't want to do this. I, I liked my life better before. And uh, they're really gun shy. Huh. Now, just explain to me, because I'm fascinated about people who write songs for others you know uh, i i love learning more and more about the people who are called the brill building writers and the carol kings and the berry man cynthia wiles and neil sadakas and all those people when you write songs do you just give them to a publisher and they decide what to do with it or are you told hey you know reba mcintyre needs a new song and then you're writing a song with her voice in your head as you're writing it. Do you do that? Yes. Pretty much every possible way you think that it happens, it happens. Uh, the word, there are, there's information circulated, who's going in the studio, what they're looking for. And if you write for a publishing company, you have access to that. Mm -hmm. So I can go into the office, I can look at the sheet and say, you know, obviously there's people on that sheet that I don't write compatible music for. Mm -hmm. So I'll look and I'll go, oh, this guy's looking for a song like this. 
And that's my wheelhouse. So I'm going to spend the day, whether I'm by myself or with some guy coming in the door or, or gal, and I'm going to write and shoot for that. Or there are times when I have an idea on the way into work. I, I came up with a little idea. I write the song. And at the end of the day, I look through the sheet and go, now, who would be good for this? And mm. then I bring it to my publisher and say, so-and-so is looking. I just wrote this song. What do you think? Doesn't that sound like him? And he goes, great. And then your plugger brings it and plays it. So there mm. are days when at the end of the day, I'm listening, going, who the hell can do this song? There are days when I say, wow, this came out of nowhere and nobody can do this song. And those are usually the ones that end up being hits. And uh, they're the ones that all along you had a target to aim for. And it almost never works. You know, you write a song for Garth Brooks. This is perfect for Garth Brooks. What did Garth Brooks say? He hated it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Um... Uh, I, I like I said, I'm really fascinated by the whole process because I think about people who wrote specifically for certain singers like Burt Bacharach for Dion Warwick or something. He okay. must have been thinking in his head, I could hear Dion sing this as he's writing it. You know, well, that... I think once Dion Dion Warwick became his avatar, yeah, I think that every melody he came up with, he had her head singing in his ear. Right, her, her voice singing in his ear, um, you know, with Carol back in you know it, it, back in those days, you know, Carol didn't actually write in the Brill Building; she wrote down the street on, at the Broadway address. Gary, she, I just did an interview with Tony Orlando, who was correcting me all about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, she's very adamant about that. No, yeah. no, we were sixteen twenty one Broadway. Okay, all right, <laughs> but. You know, D D Kirshner would walk around going, I need a song for blah, blah. And five different cubicles would all be writing that day for the same, for a shot at that slot. Mm -hmm. And just like in Nashville, when you hear that, uh, when you hear that uh, Tim McGraw is looking for a big ballad, everybody on the row is writing a big ballad. You know, and the, so you're you're up against all those people. You know, it's it's a competition. Yeah. Have there been any songs that you had a specific singer in mind and it did work out and it was a hit? Um. Y yeah. Uh, um. But mostly those are they're not work for hires. But they're specifically, we need you to try to write something. We need this. And uh, for, a, for a few years, I wrote for Desmond Child's company. And he was connected to, um, he was connected to, to uh, 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 the, what was the original singing competition? I can't even remember the name. American Idol? Yeah, American Idol, but he also was producing. Um, God, I think uh, he wrote for Clay Aiken. Is that who you're thinking of? Yeah, no, but but the the, the Latin artist of uh, La Vida Martin. Loca, uh, of Ricky oh, Martin. Yeah, so he was pretty. So we were all down in Florida, and the and the 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 proposal was. We're all going to try to write a song for Ricky Martin. And I went till the last day and I wasn't really getting anywhere. And the last day I wrote with Desmond and my friend Victoria Shaw. And so we wrote a song for Ricky and Ricky ended up cutting it. And it ended up being a, a big hit duet with him and Christine Aguilera. Nobody wants to be lonely. So that was a case of here's your you know, here's your uh, your assignment. Should you accept it? Mission Impossible. Yeah, and and I remember standing outside the door, going, "I'm writing with Victoria, who is my best friend, and I'm writing with the bloody producer of the act. If we don't walk out of here with a Ricky Martin cut, with a Ricky Martin single, then shame on us." Hmm. And 
by God, by the end of the day, we had a Ricky Martin single. Wow. Well, before I pass you over to my colleagues here. What? Uh, We're not done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll do part two next week. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be 45 minutes late for that one. <laughs> um, could you explain how you how you came to meet uh, Mark Hudson since he led you to working with Ringo? Okay, it, it's a really weird thing. It always sounds weird to say, but for a while, there used to be these songwriter retreats in France. Miles Copeland owned a. Miles Copeland had REM and he had Sting, and the Police. He was a manager, and had a record label, and he did what most people, when they come into a lot of money, do. He bought a castle in France. And he was trying to basically amortize the expense by having these songwriter retreats. And you'd go to these retreats, and that was where I met Carol. That was where I met Olivia, uh, Jack Blades, and, and Tommy Shaw, the, uh, and the Night Ranger guys, and Sticks, and uh, the Hansons were there. the 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 Go Go's were there. It was amazing. It was like two weeks every year. And you'd go and you'd see all these people. And that was where I met Hudson. Hmm. And uh, we got along really good at the end of the day at like three in the morning when everybody was done working and recording. We'd all gather in the kitchen and eat cereal and and make fun of everybody. So that's uh, that was where I met Mark and we really bonded. And uh, I came back home and, and uh, you know, whenever it was, uh, Ringo had had uh, Ringo had gotten clean. Hmm. And he went to his lawyer and said, I'm ready to make music again. Hook me up with somebody to write and produce that I can start making music with. And he was also uh, Hudson's lawyer. So he put Hudson and Ringo together and they recorded, they wrote and recorded a Vertical Man. Right. And uh, one day my phone rings and it's Hudson. And he says, uh, look, I need, I need to know if you're will, if, if you're, I got an offer for you. Uh, we're going to put a band together for Ringo. We're going to go to England. We're going to rehearse. It's going to be uh, Simon Kirk on the drums, Joe Walsh. Uh, all these, you know, unbelievably cool people. And we're going to do a video and then we're going to come back. We're going to do VH1. Uh, and I don't remember the exact amount, but he basically said, and it's going to be $3,000. And I remember saying to him, I said, great. Will, will Ringo take a check? <laughs> You know, be, and and uh, and that was it. I flew to London and met him for the first time. Almost got fired five minutes in. Uh, we're on stage, and we're working on uh, Octopus's Garden, and and uh, Hudson stops the band and goes, "Gary, uh, in the bridge, what are you singing on the bridge?" I said, "Well, in the first line, uh, I'm singing the harmony, third ha above." But then on the on the last two lines, I'm doubling Ring, and Ringo steps up to the mic and goes, "I've known him for five minutes, and I'm Ring," and I just I went pale. I go, "I'm I'm so getting on a plane now and flying home," and uh, you know, Hudson reassured me that uh, he only gives you that he only gives you. Shit, if he likes you, I said, I, I hope he doesn't <laughs> like me too much because he's going to kill me. <laughs> so that was how I met him. And, and uh, we started working together. And, and uh, you know, here it is just about 20 years later, and we're still working together. It's amazing. It's the start of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> yep. It, it has, right. uh, uh, I, I think I can actually call it that. Yeah. All right, Kit. Okay. Well, before I get to my questions, we have a question uh, from uh, the audience. And if you can't answer it yet, Gary, I completely understand uh, about Ringo's upcoming country album, which we uh, 
briefly alluded to a minute ago, uh, said uh, Wink55 asks, please ask Gary if Ringo's country album has more of a traditional sound or more like modern country music. It's a traditional sound. Ringo, Ringo called me up and he said, I want to do a country record. My next record, I want it to be country, but I want it to be old country. Write me a song that's like George Jones, Waylon Jennings, something from that era, you know, because he loves old country. Hmm. And uh, and that's what I did. I wrote him a song in, in that kind of a style. Uh, I can't vouch for anything else on the record. I've heard... I've heard, you know, one other track because we uh, went out to L.A. and, you know, uh, Georgia sang on it. So I got to hear it. But uh, I know that mine, you know, sounds like it comes right off of a of a George Jones record. It's mm. tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Looking <laughs> yeah. forward to it. What's yeah. No, he's not song? singing about pickup trucks and girls with cut off jeans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So no bro country. All right. Yeah. N n yeah. No, no hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the song that you wrote, Gary? You know what? I'm not going to say. Okay. That's <laughs> only because I don't, I don't, it's finished, but I don't have a copy of it because Ringo is very territorial about it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he's territorial, even with, people knowing what the title is. So I'm going to just keep my mouth shut. That's but fine. It's tremendous. Oh. I'm just saying that because an amazing writer wrote it. I'm <laughs> saying it's it's tremendous. Oh, man, I'm excited. Okay. Oh, that's great. We were just talking about the kind of country songs with ladies painted on jeans and everything. So that, that was just really funny before you came on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Um. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a little more about um, songwriting because I was so delighted to hear that you wrote Love's Been a Little Bit Hard on Me because I remember that from when I was a kid. That song was all over the radio. I mean, that well, was... Well, Juice was all over the radio in that time. Exactly. I yeah, mean, Juice, yeah, Juice was, was everywhere. Yeah. I mean, she, was, she was huge. And so I, I just wondered if you could you know, take us through a little bit. I mean, because that was such a huge hit. I mean, how do you how do you go about writing a song? That I mean, I don't know if you go about, you know, as you're sitting there writing it, thinking, okay, you know, this is how you write a tremendous hit, you know, but well, it was well, so I'll, catchy. Well, I'll tell you. I was writing songs every night trying to write the song that was going to save me from being an electrician. <laughs> but what, and, and the realize, realization that hit me is I would write songs, I would record them and send them to this guy in New York. And he was listening to see if, you know, when I was going to write something that, that might, you know, get everything started. But what I realized was I was writing songs like the guys I love. Neil Young, Bob Dylan, and they were long, you know, you know, 72 verses and no point. And, and I was not giving him what he was looking for. And one day I kind of had the realization that I was writing songs like the songs that I was listening to at home, but I wasn't writing songs like I was hearing on the radio when I was in the truck driving around being you know, elect electrificating all of Connecticut. So <laughs> that was when I said, let me analyze what it is. And I realized that I was way trying to overachieve. I was being so much more complicated than I need to. And so I vowed one day that I was going to write the simplest song I could. I was just going to try to write something simple and I was hearing songs on the radio where the choruses was one line over and over and over again. So uh, I'll show you. I was sitting. I don't know. Can you hear this? A bit. Yeah. A okay. Yeah. So uh, I was outside on, on our swing set. And I was playing. This is an E chord. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and I discovered, I was still kind of learning the guitar, and I discovered that if you take and don't change your fingers, but just move up the neck, there are places on the neck where it sounds really cool. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write really simple, and I'm going to write something that goes up the neck like that. And that ended up being... And I just started singing repetitive things. And that song only has about, you know, eight lines of lyric in it. And then it's the title repeated over and over and over. And I thought it was so dumb that I only wrote about 45 seconds of it. And I sent it to the guy in New York with a bunch of other 20 minute songs. And he wrote back and said, I love it. Oh, which one, which one? The 45 second law, why is it so short? I said, it's short because it's stupid. And he goes, no, no, you got to finish it. And I'm going, okay, well, that'd be pretty easy. There's hardly anything to it. So I finished it, sent it to him. And the next thing I know, he said, I sent it to a friend of mine down in, in Nashville, uh, a guy named Bob Montgomery, who played it, uh, you know, for all the, for a guy named Richard Landis, who produces Juice. And they wouldn't tell me who or what. They just said, hang on, something good is happening. And the next thing I know, they call me up and they say, it's going to be on the radio. And it was on the radio and and uh, and it was on pop radio. It wasn't on country radio. Yeah, that's right. it, was a, it was a pop hit along with, you know, Stevie Wonder and McCartney and the Human League. Yes. You know, and that was, was. A, that was a fun summer, 1982. Yes. And uh, it uh, it was just me being as simple as I could. And it really taught me a valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, and that lesson is you can never have the bar low enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's stuck in the head. I mean, it, that chorus just sticks in your head. You know? that's, the, that's the key to it. That's the key. You know, to this day, I always say, I think it's harder to write Love Me Do than I am the walrus. Mm. You know, because it's hard to find that short, concise Bless you. thing that's going to stick in people's heads. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know? And then how would you compare that? Because you actually brought up, I always like Nobody Wants to Be Lonely. I was also thrilled that you were involved in that because I remember when that came out and I remember at the time thinking that's one of the best pop songs I've heard in a while. Uh, oh, you great. Know, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Because at that time I was getting pretty snobby about, um, you know, modern pop music. And when that came out, I thought that's a, that's a really good song. That's a, one of the more memorable songs I'd heard in a long time. So how would you compare writing that to something like love's been a little bit hard on me? Well, it's a little apples and oranges because mm -hmm. I wrote Love's Been all by myself and it was in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, but the but, but the nobody wants to be lonely. I, I wrote I wrote with two piano players. So first of all, um, you know, that takes it in a certain direction. We knew we wanted it to have a Latin feel, so that takes it in a different direction. And we knew we wanted it to be a love ballad of, and, you know, and, and a bit more of a story. So it's really different to write a song like that compared to that first one, because, uh, you know, you, 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 you want it to be a hooky chorus, but, but it's not a mindless one. And I don't mean mindless in a bad way, you know, but, you know, to start with a Latin feel, you know, that, that song started because I, I just was sitting there. And, you know, Desmond went, that's, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. And he goes, I, I like that. Well, that. And then he plays the piano with it. And all of a sudden I go, oh, I'm a genius. <laughs> yeah but but yeah i really like that it. it's a nice chord changes to it i mean it was pop but it had some you know 
some real sophistication to it. That's what I always liked about that song. Well, it had a different version when they first recorded it. Mm -hmm. They recorded a very pop version of it. Mm -hmm. And we were very excited. It was coming out. And then all of a sudden we got word that it's that they've pulled it. And, you know, Vic and I are immediately go down to Home Depot to get some rope to hang ourselves. And uh, oh. and then they call us back and go, no, 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 we pulled it because we're going to re-record it as a duet with Christina Aguilera. Mm -hmm. And that version was not as peppy. It was much more sultry, yeah. Latin, sexy. Mm -hmm. They kind of brought out a little more Ricky Martin in that one. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Understood. Yeah. Great, yeah. great song. Um, and and I just before I hand you over to Tom, I wanted to wanted you to expand. I found a great uh, quote of yours from an interview um, you did back in the '90s, actually. And uh, you said a, a a great thing about songwriting. You you said um, uh, you said you. I think you can teach anyone to be a songwriter, but you said just because you have the tools doesn't mean you can build a boat and mm. what exactly what what uh, what did you mean by that what well, um, i often say that i say i can mm -hmm. teach anybody to write a song i just can't teach you to write a good one mm -hmm. and uh i've done a lot of songwriting teaching over the years um i'm i'm I've been lucky enough to actually be part of the curriculum up in Berkeley for the Berkeley School of Songwriting. So I've been able to I've been able to find a way to transmit to a starting writer the different how to give them the, the different tools. Um you know, because it it is just a Lego set. It's just putting things together and, and this and that. It's the spark where you're starting with a great idea that is the magic part of it. It's that magic lyric where when you're done writing it, you shake your head and go, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> but as far as the mechanics of writing a song, it really is a, I always, what I like to say now is you got to learn how to build a square house, just a simple square house. Just write a simple song that's like a simple square house and then write a hundred more of those to where you can write a simple square house. You can build a simple square house in your sleep. Mm. Then now build a house with a second floor, which is a more complicated song, something with a little depth to it or something with a bridge that goes somewhere new, something like that. And then do a hundred of those until you can do those falling off a trick off a lot. Yeah. And then now you're going to build a house. That's got a nice pool in the back and, and a sauna. Okay. But you gotta so that's a there, there you're learning new skills that you've never used in any of your previous songwriting. But once you've done that and you've done a hundred of those, you know how to do it. So when I sit down to write any kind of song, there's almost there's almost nothing in the floor plan that's gonna throw me where I'm gonna go, oh shit, now what do I do? I know how to build every I know how to miter every corner that fate's going to throw at me when it comes time to build a house. And uh, that's what I try to, to explain to people that, that you don't get that kind of expertise until you've written hundreds and hundreds of songs, but not just hundreds of that first floor. You've got to grow every period of time. You've got to grow and try new kinds of songs and new you know, I've never done this in a song before and things like that. So it, it, it's, that's what I mean by that. It's, it's, it's the idea of writing a song uh, 
is is uh you know is really step by step you learn as you go and you fill your tool pouch with the tools as you go until you're an old gray guy like me but man have i got a tool pouch yep that you can only get from experience like you know teaching yeah. around you so far it's absolutely like, yeah fascinating well thank you for answering my questions i, I just i love talking to songwriters and, and learning about their craft so Great. You, you have the wonderful songs to to show for it for sure so all right pass you on to tom all right well well how is your pool and sauna in the back <laughs> no pool no sauna <laughs> That's the problem. I, I... <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, Gary. We really appreciate it. And I love your John Lennon photo in the background. That's uh that's a kick-ass photo. Yeah, there's no this this is a uh, a little of everything. At, uh, yeah, John. Oh yeah. There. Oh yep. yeah. That's awesome. Okay. They're everywhere. <laughs> that's great. Um. You know, you, you, you've got to do some producing as well. You you produced probably, you know, the, my first crush uh, and still is. I still love her to this day, even though she's not with us anymore. Olivia Newton-John. Uh, can you talk about that experience a little bit, please? Oh, that was so that was so great. Um, met her in the castle in France. We. We didn't write, but we got to be friends and we got to hang out and there'd be this jam sessions and the jam sessions would be, you know, uh, Carol King and Olivia Newton, John singing harmonies and oh, wow. Keith Urban playing guitar and, and Frampton playing guitar. And it was like th th these jam sessions would go on all night. So we all got to be really good friends. <clears throat> and this is what happens all the time. Sooner or later, they all want to come to Nashville and see what it's like to write songs in Nashville. That's how, you know, Richard Marks came to town. Mm -hmm. Kenny Loggins came to town. And that's what happened with Olivia. I want to come to town and do a record. And she and I wrote like three songs. And she was generous enough to say, you, you, you produce these for me. Mm -hmm. So I, and the, on, on an album called back with a heart, right. Three mm -hmm. songs on there. And, and, produced them and and uh we just we just had a ball while she was here uh she played the bluebird with me and and uh i actually have pictures at the end of the show my back was hurting so she made me lie on the floor and i have pictures of her in this beautiful gown walking on my back <laughs> like so that's uh you know i yeah. I, I don't i don't think i don't think there's a lot of people that can say it been walked on by Olivia. Oh yeah, but it was I mean, great. It was great to have her here. She was a dear, dear friend right up until yeah. the end, and I'm real proud of those records. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you you talk about working with people you admire. I mean, what's it like to see your name in a credit for work? You know, when you're working with someone that you you admire. Well, I love. I love feeling like I'm I'm a link in the chain of their career. Mm. I like to think that, you know, till the end of time, when people are writing books about those people and at the end of the yeah. book, they're going, and here's, you know, here's the discography of the whole career. Yeah. I'm, I'm in there somewhere. And right. that's really important. It, it, it's more... It's more the moment that you have to sit down for the first time in a room with them as a writer, you know, and, uh, <coughs> you know, that first time I, I, I walked in the room to write with Ringo or to write with Carol or to write with, right. you know, all of these huge, huge people. And, um, you know, the point is, I always have to remind myself. Um, I'm not doing anybody any good by by being in awe. You know, I have to be the guy. Like when Ringo and I write together, he'll say something and he'll look at me and I'll go, "No, that we could do better than that." 
And he'll just go, all right, you're the writer. I'm just throwing out ideas. You tell me if it's good or not. You're the writer. And <clears throat> you have to be able to say to Carol King, I don't like that line. That line could be better. And here's right. yeah, Because you can't just go, oh, my God, she's Carol King. So we're going to put that line in because who is that helping? I want right. If my name's going to be on a song, if her name's going to be on a song, I love her enough and I love Ringo and Kenny and all these people. I'm a fan. I want people to go, wow, they wrote a great song. I don't know who this other guy in the parentheses is, but they wrote a great song. And if I'm, and my job is to help them be proud of, of how they right. spent the day. Right. I mean, because, you you know, my next question was going to be, I mean, do you are you critical of yourself when you're writing? I mean, because you talked about that low bar with that Joe Juice Newton song, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, do you find yourself putting more pressure on yourself when you're writing or or do you say like you constantly say, well, that's not good enough. I can do better. Oh, absolutely. I always have been the. Of, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once. I don't mm -hmm. I don't like to. I don't like to edit my songs. I don't like to get come back to songs. I like to stay at a song until it's right. And so, uh, you know, over the years, I think you just get a radar for what's good and what's not good. And, mm. you know, you, you, you can, you can feel it tickle your brain when, when you're, <clears throat> you know, when you're not as, as, Mm. Where you want a line to be, right? So yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm joking about you know, you know, the the song after "Love's Been" was a song that I slaved over. So I, you know, I didn't take that as my cue that from now on I don't have to try. That was right. you know, I was well aware that that was a a total lucky streak, you know. But I also filed away what I learned from it. But I'm very critical of my lyrics. I like to, I work, I work really hard on them and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really yeah. important. No, I, I understand. I understand. Um, speaking of writing one for Ringo, let's, can we talk about the, the track, write one for me? I'm curious when, when you do write a song for Ringo, I mean, do, are you, do, do you get to be a part of the whole process? Like, you know, I'm curious, like when Willie Nelson will, 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 will come into the track and do you thinking, okay, well, um, maybe you already knew that Ringo wanted to do a song with, with Willie Nelson. I mean, how, how does, how does that work for you? Of uh, Hudson and I started that song at one of those Miami things with Desmond. We just snuck off because because uh, I had that idea of write one for me. And I thought that would be, a, I knew he was doing Ringo and I thought that would be a, a, a clever, you know, eight days a week, funny mm. friends. Mm. And, right. uh, and then we brought it to Ringo, finished it. it you know, the, the problem is I live in Nashville. Those yeah. guys live out in LA. So uh, what normally happens when I go over to Ringo's to write a song in L.A., we write the song, then we go into his studio, and I'll lay down an acoustic guitar. We'll do the acoustic guitar and the drums, and then I'll sing a scratch, and he'll probably replay the drums later, but my acoustic guitar stays on the track. So I'm on the track as acoustic guitar. And then if I can swing it, I'll come back out to LA and sing harmonies on it. Mm. But while they're working on it, I never know when they're going to work on it. So right. I'm in Nashville. They're there. And all of a sudden you get a phone call from Hudson going, hey, guess what? Uh, I'm going to do, I, I got Willie to come and sing. He's going to do right one for me as a duet. If I was free and, uh, and frivolous with my money, I might hop on a plane just to be a fly on the wall while they were doing it. Um, I don't remember why I, I didn't, you know, but, uh, you know, it's kind of like I'm there for as much of it as possible. Right. You know, when Hudson was doing all those records, 
you know, and now, you know, Ringo's there and he's working on it whenever he feels like it. And that kind of leaves me out of it because I'm not, you know, can't pick up the phone and say, hey, come over. We're going right. to Ben Mott Tench on a song. Right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I've been trapped in the basement. I have hope. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, you, because there's times then, too, well, his, his name will be on the writing credit. Um, does that come later? I mean, you said you present, you and Mark will present a song to him, and then if he wants to throw in a word or two, then he gets on the songwriting credit as well, or is he on there for as a as a you know musician, more or less, creating the drums, or, I mean, how does that, you know, him? Well, that was, you know, that was one song. Um like on all the albums that we did when we were right. recording over in England. Um, no, he's in it from the beginning. He would walk in for the morning and he would say, I was on a treadmill. I came up with a title and I want it to be this kind of song. And then we would work and we would write the song all day, all of us sitting kneecap to kneecap. And then we'd go have dinner. And after dinner, we'd start and, and make the record. Mm. Um, and when I go over to his house, um, you know, he, he's like every other writer. He's got All right. you know, 20 song titles or song ideas. And I look at it and I go, oh, I like that one. And then we sit there kneecap to kneecap and write the song. That one there happened to be one that we got, we got started and then brought to him. But that was just because we were, we were bored in Miami. Mm. Be the into- title of my autobiography, by the way. Yeah, more than Miami. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious about how you feel about the current state of, of touring, where it's going, where it's going to be in like 10 years when all these legacy acts are, you know, not able to do it anymore. Um, you know, do you see the younger song singer songwriters musicians getting the opportunities i mean we i mean for me i'm a rock and roller from heart you know i don't think i i don't hear like the new rockers getting the opportunities to get on radio maybe like the people in the 60s 70s 80s and even into the 90s you know got i mean how do what are you what's your feelings going into you know touring in the future and and the younger the younger generations getting the opportunities that maybe to be a songwriter or a musician that that you got well, from a from a songwriter point of view, it it looks like uh, it looks like the you know the the real time of the era of opportunity has gone. Oh wow! You know, certainly in 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 Nashville, um, every artist seems to have his own little posse of songwriters that all kind of write the same kinds of songs and mm. and so they kind of get into a groove and stay there mm. um, independent songwriters songwriters that just write a song and then say who's going to cut this song there's not a lot of opportunity for that person anymore you know it used to be where everybody's album was eight outside cuts and two written by the artist Mm. And now it's the opposite. It's like nine written by the artist and one outside song, but it better be a song of the year. Mm. You know, yeah. as far as it is real interesting. It's an interesting uh, uh, scenario you paint only because when Springsteen stops. Right. And McCartney so, stops yeah. and Sting stops and Billy Joel stops. What's the next tier that comes up? The Arctic Monkeys? Mm-hmm. You know, what is the next tier of... I know that people like Taylor Swift, you know, are, are putting on amazing shows. That seems more like a like a phenomenon than a sustainable. I I don't know. I don't know how long she could keep that kind of thing up. 
you know, the, the dynamic of an artist doing an album and then hitting the road so he can play you the songs off the album. So you'll go and buy the album. Right. That seems to be gone down. Yes, I agree. You know? Yeah. Only a few people can do it. I mean, Neil Young, Bob Dylan still kind of do it, but, but, you know, McCartney stones, you know, they're, they're paid by numbers. I think now. Yeah. They're not out there saying, here's my new record. They're out there more in a come see me while I'm still on the right side of the grass. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know what happens after after that. You know, really, who's the who's the next person that comes through town? Right, where you Sell say, yeah. I gotta see them so I can right. say I saw them once. You know, in my life. Right. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Very interesting conversation here. I want to uh, get back to Ringo for a moment. And um, you did a, a marvelous interview on my other podcast, I should say, about a year ago, yeah. and you said today. And I think it's important for everyone who is watching this um, to know on these Ringo albums, very often you'll have a lot of songwriters on one song. There'll be Ringo, you, Mark Hudson, Steve Dudas, uh, Dean Grakel. And it just seems like, you know, with so many people all working on the same song, how much can each guy contribute to the song? And you had said in a way that there was, in some ways, there was some kind of formula, never a total formula all the, all the time. But like you would be kind of the melody guy very often and Mark Hudson would write the lyrics and Steve Dudas would contribute a lot of guitar parts and take take you in a different direction with chord progressions and stuff. And, and Dean Greco is also a great lyricist. Can you explain in general, other than what I just said, um, you know, how all that worked when you have so many contributors working at the same time? Yeah, we all did sort of fall into our, our roles. Um, There are times when Ringo would come in with an idea that would be a line or two and a style of a song. And then, you know, Dudas's job was, he was such an amazing guitar player that, you know, once the recording started, it was like 90% him. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. But while we were writing, he was a guy that would go, you know, guys, there's a cooler chord you could go there. Look at this. And we would look at him and go, we have no idea what that is, but it's really cool. So that's in the song. When we get to that part in the song, I'll stop playing and you play that chord. So he, that was his role is, is for that. Dean, there were songs on the record where he handed us a big chunk of lyric. And then we would create the song out of that. A lot of times I would always get into the studio first and putter around. So there were a lot of times when, when everybody got there, if Ringo walked in and didn't have something pressing, I would say, I started this this morning thinking it sounded like what we're doing. And then if he liked it, we would take that and Hudson and I, you know, would, you know, we, we would tweak the melody. We were pretty even on melody. We we're pretty even on, on lyrics. And if it was something that wasn't a page that Dean handed us, you know, he'd be the good second verse man, you know, you get to the second verse and, and he walks out of the room and comes back and go, what about these lines? You know, and that that's a load off when you know you have a guy that's a good second verse man. Right. And, uh, you know, and it was really fun because when we started writing the record, we all grabbed different instruments. We never knew from song to song who was playing what. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll be playing bass. I'll be playing electric guitar, mandolin, whatever, just when you start to hear the song start to take shape, the song tells you what it needs and uh, you grab whatever's close to you. But 
it is a lot of it is a lot of people, but at any given time, it's still just one you know one or two people uh, steering the boat and hmm. you know asking for the occasional gust of wind from the other guys. Were there ever times when Ringo was the real heavy in the songwriting of a song? Um, I mean, he was always there. He was always contributing. He was always, you know, uh, he, he pretty much left melodies to us, mm. except for the fact that he knew what he could sing and what he couldn't sing. So he'd go, no, no, no. Try, can we do it more like this? Um I mean, he's not the bus driver, but he's the bus. <laughs> no, he Good used point. to say, he used Good to way say, to put it. Yeah. He used to say he's really good at starting a song, but he always needed help finishing it. So would you yeah. say in most cases, like you said, he'd come up with a song title and maybe a line? And then the rest of you would elaborate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is, you know, which basically describes songwriting. Mm. Sometimes just coming up with a great title is tough. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know, if I'm, if I'm doing a co-writing session and I come up with this great title, I'm comfortable if I don't say another word for the day I've, I've, earn my 50 percent mm. you know without that first great idea you know we're we're just we're we're just visiting mm. you said something in the in the other interview on things we said today that i wish you'd elaborate on um and i'm really glad you said it that ringo is a much better singer than he gives himself credit for absolutely Absolutely. He, uh, you know, when he's, when he's playing live, mm -hmm. he, you know, he lowers the keys of the songs because since he's not known as a singer, he worries that he doesn't have the technique that would be able to sustain singing over two or three shows in a row. Hmm. So he solves that by lowering, you know, but sometimes that bleeds into the studio where he'll go, uh, I can't hit that note. And we'll go try and he'll hit it and it'll be great. It's like he is, he's, he's much, a much better singer than he gives himself credit for. Um, this new country song that he's done of mine, um, it's a tremendous vocal. He sounds so oh, great on it. Cool. Happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. How do you see the difference between what Ringo has recorded with what I call the Mark Hudson period and everything that followed? Because he's he's written with so many other songwriters now since that time, um, recorded in a variety of styles, music genres. Um do you have a preference for the Mark Hudson time or does it really matter? Or, you know, how do you see what the difference was between having Mark there and the Roundheads and then what followed? I've never really thought about it before, but if I had to think about it now and 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 you're forcing me to, <laughs> um, it's kind of like, when he was working with Hudson, it was kind of like his George Martin period. The songs had lots of layers. They were, you know, every hole had something in it. And since he stopped working with Hudson, I feel like he's in his John Lennon period which is, I got a guitar, I got drums, I got bass. 
what else do you need? So the songs are recorded and they're a lot more basic, a lot simpler. They're a lot, um, you know, they're a lot more stripped down. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's like comparing tug of war to, to, uh, to John's first record, Plastic Ono Band. Huh. You know, that's, with Hudson, he was making tug of wars. Ever since Hudson, he's kind of been making Plastic Ono Bands. Hmm. Some people prefer tug of wars. Some people prefer Plastic Ono Bands. It's all, yeah. Yeah. everyone has their own taste. But it's been, it's been, really uh revelatory for me to just see all these various people from dave stewart to van dyke parks to richard marks to gary nicholson to all these names of people that he's written with and the styles are very different and a lot of that comes with the the songwriting partners that he wouldn't have had in the mark hudson period and i love believe me i i've always said i think that Apart from the Ringo album, which is a classic from 1973, and and Time Takes Time, which I think is definitely, you know, the moment there when he realized he's really going to put the effort in on every album with with all the songs. Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, Choose Love are the, among the best albums of his solo career. And they're very focused. They have more of a Beatles sound to them. I think Mark was really striving for that. Yeah. And um he's moved away from that since then. So Yeah, you're right. And it's unavoidable because instead of the same people writing the songs and having it be, you know, have a certain consistency there, you've got all these different co-writers, and every co-writer kind of brings a, a different idea of what the song can be to the song. And uh they're all really, really different. I I know what you mean. I'm I'm certainly partial to the Hudson era, too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, sometimes I so I I certainly see the value in a record, you know, with a consistency to it, mm -hmm. you know, written and produced sort of in the clubhouse mm -hmm. as opposed to it's real interesting to have every track be sort of outsourced you know that's an interesting way to do it but right. if nothing else Ringo likes to try things mm. you know? yeah. Yeah. Um, I had the chance to see the Roundhead show in New York City when you played at Irving Plaza I didn't see the one at the bottom line, which that was vertical man time. So you weren't with Ringo at, at that moment. Yeah, I played the bottom line. Oh, you did? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved seeing the roundheads with Ringo. Was there ever a chance that it could have gone beyond that and done any kind of tour? In, you know, I love the all-star band tours. Don't get me wrong. You can't go wrong with any of the people that he's chosen. Yeah. But you guys were so tight as a band and all you got to do is you know watch vh1 storytellers or listen to especially choose love where i feel a real difference in um you know feeling like a band um was there but believe me yeah. you know believe me there wasn't a time when we were together where we were out of ring ringo earshot hmm. that we weren't saying why don't we take this on the road? Why, why do we not do this? And I really just think that he was, he just didn't think that he could sing in front of band for 90 minutes. Hmm. I, I can't, I can't see why he didn't. We were all available. We all would have jumped at the chance. Um, I mean, the reason 
sometimes I think the reason why he started the all-star band was, you know, you, you, you know that a, a place is going to sell out when it, you're not only seeing Ringo, but you're seeing Dr. John and you're seeing Joe Walsh and you're seeing uh, Rick Danko. Mm. And if you don't sell out and it's just Ringo Starr, I don't think he wanted to take that chance. Mm. You don't think he was just, con you, do you think he just lacked confidence at that time? As much as any Beatle could ever lack confidence, um yeah, I think he I, I think I think he was he was worried that we that it would it would be more work to do it than he was comfortable committing to. Okay. You know, he, yeah. doing a tour, a lot of promotion goes into it. Yeah. 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 You know. Gary, not everybody is Paul McCartney giving you a three-hour concert. I've gone to a lot of concerts recently where, and I understand it, as, as certain artists get older, maybe they can't sing for two hours anymore, and it's now an hour and a half or less. When when Ringo played with the Roundheads, that was like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes or so, or to an hour and a half, right? I think you'd be surprised. I think it was shorter than that. Huh. But who knows? But... I mean, we always used to get together and say, you know, he doesn't have to do it all. He could go back on the drums and 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 Mark and I will sing Day Tripper. You right. know, there's there's yeah. there's six Beatles songs that we could do where he could just sit in the back and drum and everyone wants to hear him. Right. right. You know, who doesn't want to hear him do, you know, play Day Tripper? Mm -hmm. um, but. We couldn't get the idea to, to, to get any traction. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. One more thing I want to ask, and it has to do with Ringo as a producer. Because even during the Mark Hudson period there, they shared production credits. And now he shares production credits with Bruce Sugar. Is he very hand, hands-on when it comes to production? Does he have a lot of ideas there? Or does he let the other guy do a lot of uh, you know, the creative part of the production? Well, I think, you know, from, from the time that I've spent behind the board with people, I don't think that's his job. I think, you know, I think, I think you've, you've, I think when you're starting out, you have a co-producer, you have a producer that could basically tell you what your songs are going to be like and what you're going to sing them like mm. and how you're supposed to act on this line and that line. And you get to a certain point in your career when those opinions are now yours. Mm. And one, one person can say, well, that's the job of the artist. But another person would say, well, now he's doing half of what the producer used to do. So he deserves to be co-producer. I don't think, you know, whether it's Ringo or Springsteen or Neil Young or anybody that gets a co-producer credit that's an artist of that experience and age, mm -hmm. I think they would stare at you like a dog staring at an adding machine if you said, uh, you know, so you want to throw a... a a slapback echo on this, or do you want it to be, you know, they're going to just look at you and go, what are you talking about? Mm. That's not what they're there for. And that's not why they deserve a producer credit at that point. Mm. I'm not sure if that, that answers it, but uh, I'm sticking with it. Just from experience <laughs> of what you've learned through the years, you know what you want, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that Garth Brooks is now listed as co-producer of all his stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that he doesn't know where to put the mic for a kick drum. But that's not what his job is. His job is... His job is to do what Rick Rubin does. Know when it's right. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, I definitely. Perfectly. Yeah, but, no, I, because no, I, I think I see where, what you're getting at, Ken, because I think, you know, ever since Ringo has started, whether it's, you know, co-producing or whatever his own records, you know, after the Mark Hudson uh, years, that there's definitely a change in sound. Um, mm -hmm. So which would, and I, and I like it. You know, I, I mean, I, I like Ringo's um, stuff uh, post Mark Hudson too. I mean, love the Mark Hudson stuff, but, but I like, you know, there's, there's just definitely been a change in sound and, and, uh, and material to me uh, mm -hmm. since he's, he's produced or taken a greater role, whatever that role is in, uh, in producing it. And so I wondered if, yeah, if there was a, it has been any particular change in, in your working relationship with him since, you know, since those years. Well, you know, Mark Hudson makes very Mark Hudson-y records. Mm -hmm. You know, he, 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 he knows what he's going for and he, you know, he's a, he's a child of that sixties, George Martin era. And, uh, he knows how to make it happen. And uh, Bruce Sugar is a much cleaner current producer. Gets great sounds. Um, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure that where Hudson would go, okay, now it's time to put on the Vox guitar and then we're going to put on a Rhodes. I'm sure that Bruce and Ringo listen to the bare bones track and look at each other and go, what do you think? And then they kick yeah. ideas back and forth, you know, where, where, when it was ring, when it was Hudson, you know, Ringo was definitely in the house eating vegetarian nut loaf while Hudson was doing this step, that step, this step, that step. And mm -hmm. Ringo comes back and goes, whoa, cool. Yeah. <laughs> but I like you phrase it a cleaner production. I think that was kind of what I was trying to get at. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is definitely it's very, cleaner, meaner production. Yeah, it's very clean, very crisp. Even the drums sound, yeah, like they're, like like they're, they're playing right next to you. Yep, I agree. Yeah, Can I ask. Uh, I got one last thing. Um, he's going to be eighty four this year. Um, still recording music, still touring. Um, do you, do you amaze by that? I mean, is, is it really for him? Is it really because of the love of the music? I mean, what keeps, what keeps the man going? I am amazed at that. It's not something that just happens. He really works at it. Trainers and, and this and that. And I swear to God, you look at him and McCartney and you got to say yeah. that there's something to vegetarianism, yeah. <laughs> something to it. That can't be just a coincidence, you know, that, that, uh, you know, if the man hasn't had a hamburger since, uh, you know, Ray Kroc was playing little league. <laughs> um, so, uh, can he keep doing it? You know, I seen the guy come on stage and do more jumping jacks than I could do. Yeah. And he's 84. I, I it, he's a, He's a marvel. It's kind of amazing. You know, I guess the fact that he's a drummer has a lot to do with it because, you know, burns a lot of calories and it moves a lot of, it just about moves every muscle in your body. So that probably has a lot to do with yeah. it. Um, I mean, you need a lot of stamina to be a kid, you know, to be drumming all the time, right? Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. amazing that you know, with the All Stars, he doesn't you know leave the stage and go to the dressing right. room. He goes back and plays with everybody else. Right. You know, it's it's a uh, boy. I hope I hope it keeps on. You know it. You know it. You know. Well, like we've been saying, Willie Nelson is 90, 90 yeah. He's still yeah. doing it. And... Yeah, yeah. Even if you know, even if Ringo just sits in a chair and sings like Phil Collins. Yeah. You know, it's still yeah. it's still a beetle. That's right. Yeah. You got two left. That's right. Well, you know, the the joy in all this is just knowing that this is, like he said, what he loves doing between recording and performing. 
this is this was his goal in life. <clears throat> and so that's exactly what he's doing, whether it's making EPs or now an album. Yeah. Tree album and touring twice a year now. <laughs> it used to be in the very beginning, you had to wait three years in between tours. And now it's every year and he tours twice in a year. So yeah. it's amazing. I, I think I think he, you know, he probably I mean, anyone in his position would probably get the feeling of if you don't use it, you lose it. Hmm. And at that age, yeah. taking a year off would would be not good for somebody that age. So I think he uh I think he just wants to keep keep hitting it and and uh it's it's stunning how healthy and spry he is and mm -hmm. and how he bounds across the room, you know, yeah. when he comes in a room. Yeah. Well, what about you? What keeps you going? Uh meth mostly, but uh <laughs> no. what keep what keeps me going? Um <laughs> You know what? I was talking to Georgia about this the other day. I think back of the 16-year-old kid that was, you know, just learning the guitar and thinking, thinking of all the things that might happen. Wouldn't it be amazing if, and there isn't a bloody one, wouldn't it be amazing if, that hasn't happened to me. Wow. Wow. And, you know, so every day it's, it's, Nothing else has to happen. My life has already wildly exceeded all my expectations. So now it's just looking at the next project and just enjoying the shit out of it. I got a book coming out in a, in a couple of months. Wow. About the Beatles. Ooh. And uh, I'm going to be at the uh, Beatle Fest this weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll be talking more about the book there. And, and uh, I'm recording the audio version of it right now. And and uh, you know, got the got the Ringo record coming out, just got a cut with on Kenny Chesney's new album. Great. So if I, you know, if I could come out of the basement, you know, I'll test tomorrow. And if I'm That'll be my if hopefully it'll be my second negative test so I can rejoin the rejoin the real world. Excellent. Yeah. What's but, the name right. of your book? Uh, it's called Come Together. Okay. Wonderful. To it's yeah. fiction. It's a it's a rock and roll fantasy. Oh wow. Rock and roll fairy tale. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. Yep. Okay. Uh, no, Go ahead. Go ahead. As no, far as is concerned, I'm sorry. You, you're no. not there all three days, right? No, because uh, you know, with Hudson, I'm in a I'm in a Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young tribute right. band with Hudson and our friend Mark Mirando, and right. we're playing the night before in Terrytown. Right. And then the next day, I'll go. I'm going to stop by the fest and spend the day there and visit with uh, uh, Bissonette and and uh, and. Uh, see billy uh billy j kramer right we wrote a song on his new album mm. oh, me, wow. mark, me mark hudson and mark Miranda wrote a song that i think is going to be a second single off of isn't that cool billy yep. j kramer uh-huh very how, cool how cool is that <laughs> we've been friends for a long time yeah it's going to be really great to meet him finally mm -hmm. wow okay wow. So right. you're only at the fest on Saturday. I want to make sure that we mention this because you you did say the the show at Terrytown Music Hall, which is this coming Friday. That's the the Laurel Canyon Band Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young tribute. How did that whole thing start to do that tribute band? Well, on a lot of the projects that Mark's done, Joey Molland, uh, um, uh, you know, just all the way back, hmm. uh, whenever we can, the three of us. Mark Mirando, me and Hudson um, do the harmonies. So we know we love singing together. And then one day Hudson just called up and said, why don't we do a tribute band? 
and you know we knew it was really easy because we knew the songs mm. and we uh we worked it up and got an agency and and we're playing a lot it's really fun it's really a lot of fun to do those songs you know you do you do kind of remind me of stills do you do the stills bit I'm the stills guy. I play all the stills stuff with the special tuned guitars and things. It's really, it's really fun. It's fun to learn all those differently tuned songs. Mm. Mm. Cool. You've also got a show coming up in New York um, at the cutting room with your wife, Georgia Middleman. Right. That's with Jim Valance. It's called Nashville to New York. What's that all about? Well, we started this, um, a, a, you know, 10 years ago, where we would come up, we'd play the cutting room, and we would bring one or two Nashville writers. Um, we had, you know, Mike Reed and Don Schlitz and and all these amazing writers would come up. And it was a way to let the people in New York hear just how great the writers were in Nashville. Mm. And uh, then the pandemic hit, so we stopped. And we're starting it back up again, but we're only bringing in you know, one writer at a time. And when we stopped because of the pandemic, Jim Valance was our next guest. So mm-hmm. now three years late, we're going to have Jim up there singing all those uh, uh, great Brian Adams songs that he wrote. Okay. Oh, nice. There was a show that I caught in New York, and I'm not sure if it was a Nashville to New York one, but it was a, a songwriter showcase. And you were there with Mark Hudson and Olivia Newton John was in the audience. Mm. Yeah, was that at the bottom line? That sounds right. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's we used right. to have those. I remember I did one with uh Robert Lamb from Chicago. Chicago, yeah. Yeah, that was really and uh and Eric Bazilian. That was a really cool night, you know, from the Hooters. Oh, okay. Oh. Eric Bazilian, uh, uh, What If God Was One of Us, he wrote that. Mm. Yeah, that man, the bottom line used to put on some really cool eclectic shows that would have people in a row that you wouldn't normally see. Mm. Okay. Wow. I had you listed for playing the Laurel Canyon band at City Winery. Was that, is that still going to happen? In the past. We're not, we're not, uh, we don't have any dates in the future coming up. Oh, Okay. All right. I was just looking at your website, so I saw it there. Yeah, well, the, the, at our age, we're lucky we know how to turn on our website, much less keep it up to date. And you'll also be doing a live show on your Facebook page? On yeah, we, George and I started doing that when the pandemic hit, and we were doing one, we were doing two shows a week. All during the pandemic, we did one on Sunday and one on Wednesday night. We did it late at night because we had fans that were like in Australia, so they could see it in the morning, you know, eight days later or something. And uh, we really did. We built up this great audience and uh, they'd come to all the shows. And because we travel a lot now, we don't do it that often, but we still we still do it on our Middleman Burr Facebook page. Okay. All right. Very good. And we're going to have the links in our description box if you want to purchase tickets for any of these shows, for Terry Time Music Hall and for The Cutting Room. And don't forget that Gary will also be at the fest this coming Saturday. Yep. And uh, and what what was going on with, uh, I know Kenny Loggins is sort of retired or he's only going to do occasional shows. Is that it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he seems a little vague about it it's just uh you know the days of getting on a bus or a plane and you know hitting 30 cities in a row are yeah you know he so uh i'm sure he'll do you know corporates or benefits and things like that but um yeah the touring days at this point seems like they're stuff he had a great final show in santa barbara that that George and I actually got up and played with him. And Michael McDonald was there, Richard Marks. It was a mm. tremendous night. Wow. Wish yeah. I was there for that one. <laughs> it was great. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, this, this has was been great, guys. Gary. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, you for thank you so much. It was a pleasure. 
apologize again for the late start, but uh, my brain's a little foggy. <laughs> we made it happen. Right. Get better every day. Good. So glad. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, yep. you're going to have a blast this weekend. Well yep, done. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. It will We're looking forward to seeing you there. Great. Are, are the three of you going to be there on Saturday? Going to be there all three yep. days. Yep. Great. I'll, I'll, I will I will find you and hunt you down and say hello. And you'll also see my other two uh, co-hosts from the things we said today there, too. Dara DeVivo and Alan Cozen. Great. So. Great. It's, it's going to be really... I haven't been to one of these in, boy, you know, 10 years, if, if not more. Wow. Yeah. So it's going to be really interesting. And I've never been to one where I was participating. Okay. Wow. I usually would just come and visit if, if Hudson was there mm -hmm. or somebody else I knew was there. Or I just, you know, but this is the first time I actually have something to do. You'll have a blast. You'll love it. Looking Can't forward wait. to it. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care. All right. All right. That Good was stuff. a great conversation. What a great guy. Yeah. yeah. He's wonderful. You know, really what a is. what a history he has, you know, not even talking about Ringo, everything else. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I mean, with you know, was, I mean, I loved hearing the stuff about Ringo, but I mean, just hearing about his songwriting experience, that was fascinating. Yeah. Anybody like that who has written so many songs that were covered, recorded by so many artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look them up online. It's more yep. than the list that I gave. Yep. And uh, it's just so impressive. And, uh, you know, looking forward to everything else he's got in the future. And I hope he continues to work with Ringo, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I can't wait for that country album. Me right. too. Yeah, yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, people, yeah, yeah, those of you writing in the comments, I saw some of your, your comments. Yes, that country album is, sounds like it. I mean, it just sounds better and better, doesn't it? <laughs> Gonna be a banger. A banger you know, indeed. <laughs> on things we said today, we did an interview with Bruce Sugar recently, and he was just saying, because the, the Ringo was working on the country EP, and Linda Perry couldn't get her schedule coordinated to work with Ringo. So it looked like the next EP was going to be the country EP, but now it's right. going to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. So the Linda Perry EP produced and all the songs written by Linda, that'll be next. And uh, well, that hopefully happen. it'll be right. next month, I would think. Mm -hmm. I have ask Gary about that because originally the country EP was going to right. be. Right. So we'll see. But yep. we got uh, an EP and an album coming out from Ringo this year. Cool. I have no complaints here. Well, yeah, we'll take it. And hopefully, exactly. keep fingers crossed for a new Paul record. That's right. That's the rumor. No. Okay. That's too much to hope for. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> We're greedy, and I don't care. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's true. All right. So, do you want to say anything, Kit, about uh, the fest? And yes. Um, well, first of all, um, I'm I'm sorry to say, unfortunately, I am not going to be there. Um, my uh, my father is um, it's nothing life threatening, but uh, but he's uh, under the weather, um, and so and we went to the doctor today, and the doctor did, felt that it was a little risky for me to go and and leave my folks alone uh for you know four days or whatever it is so uh so unfortunately i'm not going to be able to be there but uh but talk more talk is still going to have a panel uh, at the fest yes. so i will be there in spirit and mm. uh and the panel is going to be let me get the schedule here i had it open okay the uh well naturally you guys are going to be on a bunch of panels uh, throughout the weekend um, and the talk more talk panel is going to be okay Saturday at 6 30 uh, Eastern of course it's going to be a crossover panel with two legs yep. and uh, and it's going to be the uh, year in 1974 in solo so uh, you know kind of a overview of, of uh, you know of the year and uh, sort of the best um, in uh, solo albums, songs, and uh, Ken Womack will be there uh, mm. as well, and uh, and of course Andy, 
uh, the whole gang will be there except for me, but, uh, but I will be there, uh, as I said, in spirit. And then, yes, you, you will. yes indeed. And then you guys are going to be on a bunch of other panels, right? Do you want me to read those? Yeah, I mean, there's going to be yeah collectors and media. I know I'm doing a collectors and media panel. I know my name's not on on some of them, but I will be uh, um, involved. I, mm -hmm. I'm debating on whether or not to do the media. I mean, there's 20 people on that media know. panel, you know, already, you know. Yep, I was supposed to be on that too. Yeah. yeah. And Ken, you were supposed to be on that. I yeah, that's on Sunday. Know. It looks like I right. will be on that one. Yeah. All right. But there's also a things we said today panel. Yes, I believe that's right before the talk more talk two legs panel. Yes. Right. That, oh no, that is at one forty five. Okay. Actually, one forty five on Saturday. This is all in the paperback writer room. Don't know where that is, but uh, but you know because this is a new new hotel, new layout. So, but yep. there will be signs and and everything will be clear. The you know when you get there. But actually, uh, on that panel. Uh, we're going to have obviously Alan Cozen on there, but Adrian Sinclair is also coming yep. from England. The two yep. of them wrote the McCartney Legacy Part One. They're mm -hmm. finishing up Part Two right now as we speak, and we're going to have a conversation about different locations where Paul recorded in the seventies. That's a good topic. That's interesting. And how did that, if in any way, influence the sound of the records? Or, or the songwriting in any way. Mm -hmm. So did New Orleans play a big part in Venus and Mars? Yeah. You know, or how much did Lagos matter when it came to Ben on the Run? That kind of stuff. Ooh, so we're going to be doing a panel on that. And the media panel is on Sundays. So I should be a part of that. Yep. Yes. Think, yeah. yeah. Let me let me check. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's Sunday at uh, three o'clock uh sun okay. three o'clock paperback writer room pretty much any panel is in the paperback writer room mm. i should also mention because i'm intrigued and i definitely want to see this um ken womack's going to be interviewing laurie k mm. and laurie k was part of the rko team along with dave Sholin, who interviewed john and yoko the very last interview john ever gave at the dakota on december 8th and I've interviewed Lori for my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Joe right. Mayo also interviewed yep. um, mm -hmm. Lori Kay as well. And so uh, that's going to be a, a you know fascinating interview. Absolutely, yeah. There's there's a lot going on at this fest, folks. So um, you know, lot to lot to see and do. So uh, you know, we'll be busy. Be You'll be busy. But this talk more talk panel will be recorded uh, yep. for future future viewing so yeah yep. if you're not there don't worry oh can i mention one other thing because mm -hmm. in whatever their ballroom is <laughs> yeah. alan, alan cozen and adrian sinclair are supposed to be interviewing yes. lawrence juber and steve holly together mm. yep so that'll be very cool the two yeah. authors of the mccartney legacy there yeah. mm -hmm. two of them so uh yeah there's a lot going on, you know, it's, there's too much going yeah. on. Weekend. You kind of wish everything would all be filmed and, or videotaped and preserved. And, mm. you know, I would buy those as DVDs or Blu-rays. <laughs> Blu-rays. <laughs> yeah. Dolby Atmos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've heard from a few people that have listened to Ben on the Run on Dolby that it sounds phenomenal. Oh, I'm really? sure it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Cool. All right. So that that about does it for us. Absolutely. Thanks to all of you for watching. Special thanks goes out to Gary Burr for joining yes. us tonight. We will see you hopefully this weekend uh at the Fest for Beetle fans. Um thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't done so. Subscribe to all of our channels and uh we'll see you 